So in our series of talks on Ukraine and dialogues that we've had so far, um, we've covered my own sort of stream of consciousness about what I think is happening in Ukraine and why it's so important beyond the obvious reasons. Um, then we spoke with Valerie Picard, who is a sort of civil society leader and activist in Ukraine, who gave us a kind of integral spiral dynamics view of the challenge there. And then I had a conversation with Jordan Hall about war in the context of the meta crisis and how you think about um, war in that broader context of civilizational sort of unraveling and what might follow. And um, today's a little different. It's a little bit more potentially solutions oriented, maybe at least in, in ambition, um, because like many of us, I've been watching the news thinking and, and also sitting at home thinking like, what can we do? Um, what more can be, can be done? And if you're in the UK, as Anthea, our guest here and I are, um, it's a strange feeling because on the one hand, we're completely screwing up the refugee side of the equation, but equally, it looks as though we're not doing as much as we could do from the point of view of sanctions. And that got me thinking of Anthea um, because you have this background, Anthea, in money laundering and campaigning to um, call out sort of the misdirection of money. And it seemed like a good moment to check in with you about what exactly the situation is, as you understand it, what it would look like to try and do better. Um, and um, that, all, that all happens in a context of your book, your wonderful book, which of course we're very proud to publish called The Entangled Activist. And um, there's a broader discussion which we had elsewhere about what activism means and so forth. But at this moment, where it seems like the UK government could do more and the UK population wants it to do more, there may well be a call for a kind of activism on this particular issue. And also vis-a-vis -vis the title, there's a certain amount of entanglement. Clearly the UK government, particularly the Conservative Party, deeply entangled with Russian money. So that's the context as I see it. Um, and if you would like to just introduce yourself, first of all, for those who don't know you, and um, and see us, let me know how you see it. Yeah, thanks, Jonathan, and thanks for this opportunity. So, yeah, my name's Anthea Lawson. I, um, I've got a background. Originally, I trained as a journalist, um, and then I took those skills to campaign groups, professional human rights and environmental campaign groups. Um, where I worked as a researcher and campaigner on, um, first of all, the arms trade. I worked at Amnesty as an arms trade researcher and for gun control organisations trying to campaign for controls on weapons shipments across borders into conflict zones. Um, and then I worked for a decade on illicit financial flows and tax evasion and money laundering and the and the creation of poverty um, by the operations of the financial system. We were deliberately trying to reframe poverty from this thing that is just sort of magically existing uh, that just arises in certain places, you know, this very sort of ahistorical view um, that's sort of blind to colonial histories and more recent globalization histories and, and just wants to dish out aid um, to actually look at how it's created. Um, so I worked for an organisation called Global Witness that investigates and campaigns on the nexus of um, natural resource exploitation and human rights abuse and environmental um, destruction caused by the illegal logging, blood diamonds, um, oil extraction, mining. Um, and I was looking at the, um, at the money, at the money flows. I was taken on as a campaigner there to they said, oh, look, we, you know, we're doing all this work on, uh, you know, we've got these, the, at that point, some successful campaigns on blood diamonds to try to get international control systems to certify them. Um, and they were looking at getting transparency on payments for oil reviews. They said every single case we ever look at of natural resource corruption, there's a bank involved. Um, and so I turned up, this was in 2006, um, and, and on my desk was plonked this pile of, this pile of papers along with some other some other interesting sources. Um, and, so, and so I went down the rabbit hole um, trying to work out 
the depth of it. And, and what I'd like to do, actually, because I think to really understand the UK's role um, in facilitating Russian power and Russian dirty money, we, we need to go down the rabbit hole and take a step back a bit and look at look at this situation. So that's that's what I'd quite like to do for a few minutes. OK, while you do that, I'm going to put you on speaker view just so people get you without me being a distraction. <laughs> So okay. the, um, um, speaker there we go and then and then after a few years of working out sort of what was going on down this rabbit hole um we actually had some campaign successes um i can't claim to have had huge success at all in changing the environment in which banks can accept dirty money but one of the other things that we were working on uh, which we'll, we'll talk about this in more detail is the enabling structure of company and corporation in this case. Now that sounds dry, but this is about the ability to set up companies and, and not say who's really in, con in control of them, which means you can create these nested structures across different countries yeah. and it makes it absolutely impossible to see who's behind, you know, anything. You can have, a, you know, you can have an unresponsive dodgy landlord uh, and they can hide themselves. You can have somebody like cutting down bits of rainforest and not know who they are, all of that. Um, and, we, and we made a dent in that, we persuaded uh, working by then with plus a lot of other organizations persuaded David Cameron's government to change it and there's been a normative shift there are still big problems but now in more than 100 countries there are commitments to to try and change that so so to some extent there were some some we can say oh yes there were some successes there um in you know in campaigning and activism terms but oh my goodness this is this is a big 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 situation and that's only that's only one part of it um so I suppose what was what what's been very interesting to reflect on in the last two weeks, um, interesting and horrifying, is that what we always knew to be true, which was that when we went to see policymakers and you know talk to MPs or talk to regulators or try and get meetings with congressional staffers in Washington DC, um, we were talking about corruption. That, that was our work, that was our mandate, that's what our funders gave us money to do. And so I would be trying to get interest in illicit financial flows out of Nigeria into London um, or into the UK um, and how that was undermining the economy and human rights um, there. And most of the people we talk, were talking to, they weren't interested. They were interested only in security issues. And so we would try and dress dress up some of this in security issues. You know, my prevailing image of years, for years, is just sort of various sort of congressional staffers or MPs, researchers, you know, they'd be scrolling through, it was Blackberries originally, but, you know, scrolling through their Blackberries while we were, you know, talking away, presenting our sort of carefully worked out sort of, you know, briefs, mm. um, you know, in sort of political affairs form. And, and occasionally, if you sort of said something that was about, you know, security, you know, they'd sort of pop up. Um, because they knew that their boss was interested in that. And occasionally we'd, f we'd find um, a couple of representatives who would be interested in working up some potential draft legislation for us. Um, mm -hmm. But most of the time, they weren't interested in that. And, and sure enough, that's, that's, that's what uh, has been shown. Every now and again, mm -hmm. something happens that's security related or kind of big politics related, and then everyone sort of wakes up. So there's this kind of tiresome trail of me across the internet over the last 15 years, when something political happens, so when the Arab Spring happened, for example, um, and suddenly it's like, oh, are the banks in Switzerland going to freeze Mubarak's funds? Um, who's got Gaddafi's money? Why is some of it in London? Why are Swiss banks? Um, it's like, well, hold on, okay, they're getting kudos for freezing the money now, and are they sanctioning it quick enough? But, but the actual question, there is something completely different, which is, why is that money there in the first place? Um, and so once again, we find ourselves, um, it, it, it unfortunately takes it, it takes blood actually right. Right. to get people to listen to this stuff and once again this is what's happening on a, on a really on a really awful scale um so yeah that's that's the kind of bigger context of where i've come from and then and then since then i've been as you said looking at the uh the issues about how we come to do activism but we might come around to that sure. later in the conversation okay so then that's a good background i know, I know you also had a ted talk i believe where you you sort of give an overview of this and some of the highlights of it and I know yeah, that's part of me saying all this, yeah, saying yeah. the same stuff. Well, yeah, but, uh, but I mean, in a, in a very sort of polished and sort of dramatic way. Um, but also, we've had conversations where you described to me meetings with lawyers of those who are being protected, who, in very tense moments where you're trying to get a kind of justice, and they're trying to tell you, look, 
we will do everything we can to protect our client's interest. Tell me more about that, because I remember it being particularly vivid. Yeah, well, I think I think that might have been this, this one particular moment where we were actually making some headway right. um, with uh, the beneficial ownership transparency legislation in the UK. And so instead of being patted on the head and patronised, which was what often happened um, when we encountered the well-paid facilitators of this stuff, the lawyers and trust and company service providers and the bankers. You know, occasionally I got invited into banks to do to do talks to their compliance people, but mostly we were sort of patted on the head and, you know, do-gooders, basically. Right, right. But on this occasion, we were, we were invited into this lawyer's office for lunch. Um, it wasn't a fancy lunch, it was like pret sandwiches all over the table, but lunch nonetheless. Um, and for about two hours, they were grilling us about our campaign. Right. And finally, I thought, well, hold on, you guys are on, you know, like several hundred pounds an hour. Right. Um, and there's four or five of you in the room. Why are you giving us this time? And so right. I asked it directly. And this guy who'd, you know, up until then been sort of fairly sort of, you know, emollient and right. affable and professional, he just kind of looked at me um, in this very cold manner and just said, because what you are, words to the effect of what you are talking about, um, you know, directly threatens our client's interests. Right. And it, and it was very rare for them to acknowledge that money didn't usually get talked about. You know, that's all part of this sort of pimping of services. It, it, it's a bit indelicate to, to talk about what, what you're actually talking about, which is, you know, grotesque amounts of money right. um, that, you know, that are having an impact on other people, that are creating inequality and other problems. Right. Um, they, they were having to take us seriously at that point. And that's what sort of prompted this sort of show of, what seemed to be under the right. under the surface, um, which is you know which is their ultimate interest. Really. Yeah. But yeah, it was it was rare that that we would see it that that clearly. Okay. So so no. Okay, that's all useful to get a feeling for where you're coming from. And um, I think I shared with you uh, a video that was concocted online. Um, I forget the source of it, but I remember the punchline, which says that. The road from Moscow to Kiev or Kiev goes through Bel Belgravia, which is, of course, a very affluent area of London near Victoria. Um, what does that mean? Right? I've got right. some sense of what it means. Well, tell me what, that, what you think that means. The road right. from Moscow to Kiev goes through, let's say, London. Yeah, OK. So let's go down the rabbit hole. Um, and I think the first bit of the rabbit hole we have to go through is the international picture of this and then and then we'll come to the UK because because the whole point about the way that dirty money flows is it's not about a particular jurisdiction right. um, Oliver Buller the journalist he's got a new book coming out next week about this um, but he came up with this very good framing calling it money land which is it's this place that isn't it isn't in any one country it's in all the gaps in between right and that and that sort of builds on this idea of offshore that the tax justice network a sort of campaigning right. group on this right. developed which is offshore is anywhere but the country in which you would have some responsibility. Right. Um, it's, it's, it's somewhere else where they are not going to go after you for the taxes or you know, whatever, whatever your obligations um, might be. So, so it's important to bear that in mind. So the origin of the, um, and okay, well, let's, let's look at laundering, right? Because this is, this, you know, there's lots, there's lots of references to the, to the, you know, the London laundromat. You know, what does it mean to launder money? Now, laundering is a, in some ways, it's a concocted offence. Right. Um, it's it's not the primary offence. You have to have a pr in, in the in the lingo. It's a predicate offence. You have to have the primary offence in order to give rise to the crime of laundering money or the action of laundering money. And it was basically invented by the US in the 1970s as part of the war on drugs, right. as a way of kind of bringing additional forces to bear right. on the drug gangs and the flows. Um, that we're in because they criminalise drugs. And so, and so the idea is that you um, require, at that point it was banks, to do checks on the sources of their money, um, on the sources of what's coming in. Mm -hmm. um, and then the US banks sort of went, whoa, you're going to just make us do that, the money's going to go elsewhere. So the US did this very, very big diplomatic push through the OECD and other international forces to get those laws right across the world. Right. And by the 90s, they were sort of spreading spreading around the world um, and then at various points they um, they were strengthened because of these things coming in from the outside so right. after 9-11 the idea of terrorist financing money 
kind of right. got added to this. Right. And then after a while, they started adding other categories as well as banks. So, you know, the people who set up the front companies, the lawyers, they all have to do, they all have to do these checks. Now, the idea is then that you, you're a bank or you're a lawyer, or, or, you know, taking on a client and setting up a, a, an offshore structure for them. Um, and you are supposed to verify exactly who they are. Mm. You are supposed to find out if they are what's called a politically exposed person. Right. Oligarchs would be politically exposed. It means you are either ruling part of a ruling family or close to it. Okay. Um, or a mm. senior official in government. So you've got access to funds. You've got access to that sort of power. Right. Right. If someone is a politically exposed person, you've got to do a load more checks on them. It sort of increases the it increases the risk ratio. Okay. Um, and then what you do is if you have suspicions, you you file what's called a suspicious activity report to some kind of regulatory body mm -hmm. so that they know what's going on. Now, this is quite a convoluted thing rather than just saying, hey, we're going to make it a crime right. to launder money. You shouldn't take dirty, dirty money. And that's and that's where it starts to get interesting. And that's where we get into the kind of structural setup of how this system works, because right from the start, it has been a fundamental compromise. Right. And some of the details of that have only sort of started becoming apparent in the last few years with, with documents that have been revealed under the 30 year rule, where mm -hmm. you know, they're no longer subject to the secrecy provisions in the UK. And we can see some of the negotiations that were going on um, sort of cross Atlantic in, in, in bringing these regulations from the US into the UK and elsewhere because basically the banks their job is to take money and they and they have pushed back on this idea right from the start right. that there should be situations in which they in which they shouldn't right. take money right. and so and so right from the beginning the framing has been this is a it's a sort of compromise between between the banks and the other providers um, and the desire of law enforcement to go after to go after these funds uh, that might have been laundered as a way of getting to the people who've done the crime. Right. Now, this is where it gets really interesting because those are two very different frames. There's a frame of using the money going through the system after the crime has been committed from a law enforcement perspective to try and chase down the people who've done the original crime. Mm -hmm. And that's what this system, if it worked well, mm -hmm. might provide a bit of data towards doing. You know, these suspicious activity reports create a huge database that you can then, you know, they're supposed to trigger law enforcement investigations. They usually don't because there isn't enough resources, but they're there as a kind of passive resource to see, you know, where the money, where banks have filed reports on these people, where the money might have gone. Right. But actually what we're talking about here and what I was talking about with the corruption work we were doing and what we're talking about here with the enabling of dictatorship, the enabling of authoritarianism, the enabling of violence, the enabling of human rights abuse. It's a different frame um, because you don't want it to happen at all. Right. You don't want you 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 simply don't want this facilitation. And and I used to find myself saying, well, you know, these these crimes of of corruption and hollowing out of national budgets and or human rights abuses or whatever the money is being used you know, kept off budget in order to provide secret security forces. It gets used for all sorts. Um, you know, you can't, you can't do these things. You can't commit corruption on this scale. You can't disappear a quarter of your country's oil revenues mm -hmm. um, if you haven't got somewhere to put the money. There's no point keeping it under the bed in, in a conflict zone. You know, you want to get it to some countries where you can have a nice peaceful time and buy a house and not be bothered and send your kids to a nice school. And so, although it sounds sort of strangely obvious to say the crime couldn't happen without the provision of the, the right. facilitation and the money movement services, it's a, it is absolutely integral to it. And it's kind of counter to the way that the system is set up to try and catch the things after they've happened. I um, see. Oh, hang on. There's, two, there's two big points there, both of which are quite subtle, and I'm not sure I've fully grasped them yet. So the, the first one you're saying, the, the, the institutions and people who facilitate money laundering of various kinds or illicit illicit financial flows as you called it maybe that's a bigger term of which money laundering is part um that is what in in a sense incentivizes much lots of many kinds of crime and were it not there many of those crimes would be disincentivized because the the ill-gotten gains of those crimes wouldn't have a place to go and so that's the first point that that it's not a minor thing that these things exist they're in a sense 
it would be too much to say they're causing the crime, but they're certainly co-arising with the crime or, or facilitating yeah, they're facilitating it absolutely yeah. allowing it to happen yeah then your 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 second point was slightly different um and i've lost track of it um in in the in the details of the first but you seem to be saying that um the 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 nature of that business which does this criminality effectively co-arises with criminality or makes it possible and facilitates it enables it it's in the nature of that business to want money and not to ask where it's coming from. It's sort of like it, um, it, it's almost pushing, in, it's almost, it's, a, it's, a, it's an, a feature of the crime infrastructure that is, desi is by design not meant to ask where the crime is ha happening or, or whether yes. the money is criminal, right? Yes, absolutely. They, re they really don't want to, and they've been pushed at every stage, you know, in this compromise. Right. with this with this whole sort of law enforcement frame of anti-money laundering that has come in over the last sort of three four decades three and a yeah. half decades really yeah four decades um it, it, it's been a, a really big compromise all, all along so the lawyers for example were added to this regulatory regime in quite a few jurisdictions right. particularly the us they were added much later and they fought they really didn't want to be part of it right. Right. um you know, it's it's antithetical to to the whole idea of what you do, which is that right. you know you're providing this this service, and and it goes against the principles of you know of banking secrecy and so on. And so there's there's been this real sort of push me pull you sort of right. thing going on at the sort of interface of regulation um, to try and do this, and of course the power of deregulated financial capital on the other side to say no, we're not going to have that. Now some moves have been made gaps in it have been made because of the U the US is very interesting here um, they've got some huge huge problems on this and they're much more aggressive mm -hmm. much more aggressive than certainly the UK and quite yeah pretty much Europe more generally um, in going after it so some of the moves they were making in the noughties to go after tax evasion were making real dents in some of the banking secrecy right um, in this in provisions in, right. in European countries. So, so there are some dents in it, but but there is, but just while we're on the big picture before we go down the UK, yeah, yeah. there's this very, there's this very, very big dissonance ultimately in the purpose for which this regulatory regime was set up and what and how A, how things actually work in finance, and B, what what can be expected of it, basically. Right. Right. Um, I think I think we put these huge, huge expectations on it. And it it's it, it's very difficult. Now that sounds like I'm making excuses for it, and I and I really don't. I spent years saying no, we need to enforce this system better because it is it, it remains true that if the system of regulation as it is was enforced properly, right. we'd have a very different situation. Okay. It, it, it's it it it's not all bad. Mm -hmm. Enforcing it would be a really 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 good start. So so yeah. if we're looking at, I've, I've managed to identify sort of five big structural problems okay. with how this works, and that's one of them. This kind of conflict between a facilitation frame and a kind of going after crime frame. Okay, so another one I just mentioned is enforcement. Right. Mostly, it's not enforced properly. Right. Um, right. There are there are ideological reasons for that. It mm -hmm. goes against the sort of basis of how we've been running financial centres um, right. in in countries, particularly that are really under the sort of yoke of neoliberal ideology. Right. It, it goes against everything. Right. Um, one, one of the things I found very frustrating about this was there we were saying, well, come on, aren't you going to aren't you going to regulate and enforce this against banks properly you know when are we going to see some you know bankers facing serious personal consequences for this rather than just big fines that are ultimately a cost of business for the, right. the institution and we'll you know they'll, they'll go in above the line and mm -hmm. fine it's just a cost um well fine we were asking for that but you know they didn't they didn't have any costs for completely trashing the economy in 2007 and 8 it's it, it's way bigger than that so this this enforcement question is you know is is part of the picture Okay. Um, a third structural thing is, well, it's sort of related to the first one, really, but they, the governments that developed the framework weren't even that keen on using it to go after crime. You know, there was this push from the US to use it to go after the drug money. But this, this thing I was just referring to, of some of the information that's come out under the, with documents revealed on the 30-year rule, um, you know, there's a, a brilliant research paper, um, which is it's by Mary Alice Young and Michael Woodowis. Um, 
and 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 it's it's open source. It's from about four years ago, and it's and it's really interesting because you they've gone through the documentation, they've mm. gone through the kind of notes from treasury officials, you know, scribbling things in the margins. They they had no intention of of using this as a um, as a serious tool to go after crime. Yeah. Um, the main purpose was to make it look as if they were doing something, yeah. um, while actually maintaining the ability to do business. Okay. And, you know, I, it was a real relief actually to think that paper came out in two, 2017 or 18. It was such a relief because I felt, um, I felt sort of gaslit almost, right. uh, like repeated sort of experiences of utter dissonance right. from people in the system who were responsible for administering it, whether it was bank compliance officers or lawyers who, right. you know, there's this huge infrastructure of people who are employed administering this. It creates a hell of a lot of jobs. Um, kind of like well-paid white collar jobs yeah. um, and they were like oh no you know it's all fine and we're doing you know we check our boxes and whatever and, and and something in me was like this doesn't work it's not fit for purpose right. Um, right and you know seeing this analysis of the the political bureaucratic process even by which it was resisted uh was was really helpful so that's the third thing fourth structural thing is tax and, and you were hinting at this in in your sort of sort of framing of what i was saying there that effectively, this is a we've created a criminogenic environment, right. um, and the reluctance to really get to grips with it is because there are other forms of illicit, illicit financial flows right. than corrupt money, you know, being chopped from state budgets, um, or indeed the facilitation of, of violence and human rights abuse and, and authoritarian goings on, and that is tax. Mm -hmm. It's tax evasion. It's tax evasion, which is the illegal one. Um, and it's tax avoidance, <laughs> which is the, uh, the not illegal one. Um, shifting profits around from jurisdiction to jurisdiction if you're a multinational. So, you know, you book your profits in the place with 0% corporation tax and you trade internally with your own subsidiary. So it looks like you've earned nothing right. in the place where you're actually earning the money. Right. Um, let alone all of the personal um, actual evasion things that come from setting up complicated structures so you can't see. Right. Um, where the income's actually being earned. You know, given the way that politics works and, and, and how elites work and who is in power and what their interests often are, you know, we'd be asking the people who are generally benefiting right. or who, whose friends and contacts are benefiting from these systems to do something to stop this money that's a problem for security and, and democracy um, and, and corruption and poverty, but in ways that are actually going to be really problematic for their own for their own interests. Right. Um, so that kind of keeping the pipelines open for things that we want has right. caused a problem for you know, the, things, the things that we don't want. And then the other structural thing is, is this idea of, you know, the idea of offshore, this idea of you know, the anywhere stuff or money land, mm -hmm. um, you know, whatever we want to call it, is that ultimately, um, okay, yes, there, there is such a thing as international law, um, and that operates in various in various realms, but the processes of law that are used for this are largely national, and and so we're on this sort of nineteenth century conception of, of national borders and how and how jurisdiction works to deal with twenty um, first century money flows right. that can go. Uh, because international law is hard to enforce, is weak, or how would you describe that? Well, well, this 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 is the thing. I mean, what would it actually take to get a situation where, um, you know, there was genuine cooperation on this? I mean, it's 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 genuinely problematic, isn't it? Because you you know, it's very rare that you get everyone on the same page. Yeah. Um, you know, there 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 have been some really really interesting and positive moves through the OECD's process mm -hmm. um, on tax, mm -hmm. um, on getting automatic exchange between countries. So you know, so if you're a British citizen and uh, you're living in America or you've got some assets in America, let's say you're, you've got some assets in America, um, you know, they are required to automatically provide the information to the, the tax authorities here. You right. don't have to sort of wait for there to be an inquiry. Right. So those kind of automatic, not just bilateral, but multilateral systems, you know, there's, and this is a res, as a result of activism. Right. Um, right. There, there are all sorts of changes here. There are changes to do with um, uh country by country reporting, which is requiring multinationals to show what they've earned in each jurisdiction in which they operate, rather than just this aggregated thing that says, hey, look, look how much profit we made, look how little tax we, we, right. we, we paid, um, that actually shows where they earned it. So you can start to hold them to account. 
Okay. You know, so there are possibilities for cooperation, but fundamentally the money right. is moving um, in ways that it, it's really hard to keep up with um, for a national, you know, tax or criminal jurisdiction, whatever it is. Right. Um, yeah. so, so that's these big structural things in the big picture sure. before sure. we get into the specific UK yeah. bit of it. So, yeah, so we'll come to UK and Russian money in a minute. But before we get there, just one, the philosopher in me wants to know what you think of this. I mean, I had a... Uh, an opportunity a few years back and it was just after I left a sort of secure job and I was you know not yet viable as a consultant I suddenly got offered to do a talk for Shell and um you know they being Shell they were paying very well and I thought is this legit and I didn't did the best I could to you know uh be completely candid and very honest, you know made sure that there was no conditions attached and I wrote about it afterwards and I didn't hold back and uh, and yeah, and it was it wasn't such a bad experience seeing inside a fossil fuel company and how they think uh, was educative. You know, it was it was a good part of my training. But the reason I mention it now is that when I was having qualms about taking this money, I spoke to a friend and I said, "Look, it's kind of dirty money. You know, it's like we really don't want to be taking money from fossil fuel companies. It's not, you know, it's it's not the future, and you know, you're ethically tainted somehow by that." And his view was, "Ah." Uh, Money is kind of money, you know, it doesn't really make sense. It comes, you know, once once it's there, it's just money, right? Now, I'm not saying that's right, but I, I in fact, everything in my body said, no, that's not right. But I'm curious as, as an expert on this, why it's, how you'd articulate why it's not right. But the idea that money, when it appears, you know, whether it's in a bank account or one of the 10 pound notes amidst the 100 10 pound notes that, is, that has, that can be traced back to some, war crime or corruption or whatever or or child trafficking or you know whatever whatever heinous crime giving rise to the money when the money actually arises what does it mean to say it's dirty money like do you understand the question like what what makes how can it be that one one note is dirty and one isn't when they both have the same exchange value and store of value and so forth that's a really good question and I'd like to, I'm probably going to go and think about that right. and write something about it <laughs> after this conversation because uh, you've got me thinking all sorts of things that we won't have fully time to unpack here but I guess that is one of the, um, you know, there are many myths about money mm -hmm. um, that underpin. Yeah, I mean money in general is a big question mark these days. Yeah, right? that, that underpin economics um, and, you know, political economy as, as, as it currently is um, and there are lots of people working on the the possibilities of changing the stories about money. Yeah. Um, you know, I'd point you towards the work of Brett Scott, who does really yeah. interesting. And a new about. book coming out very soon, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I mean, I my sense of it is that the the myth, um, and I'm using I'm using that pejoratively, and actually I quite like myth in some ways, so maybe I shouldn't say this, but you know, the idea, mm -hmm. to use a neutral word, the idea that money is is value free and is just money in itself underpins every bit of facilitation um, and abusive business mm -hmm. that I've ever seen in 20 years of working on human rights and- It's the cardinal sin somehow. Yeah, yeah, but it, it, right. it's like, it is not value free. Right. Um, it is not value free. Yes, okay, money money can be something, can be something useful and positive. It enables things to happen. It's in the world that we're in it is the stuff of life because you know most of us are not growing our own food and and, and building our own shelter um so yeah so it does things it enables things um and it can and it can do beautiful things but also it is doing a whole load of things that are that are extremely damaging right. um and and that may do us in so i for me i sort of start from I'm, i am going to think about this and how, how how you know how we get to it but you know my immediate response is you know, my starting point is that it is not value free, but it is precisely that. Um, it's precisely that that when we get into like the deep narratives and the deep frames right. and the deep values that that we come up against when we are trying to change this stuff and when we are dealing with people who, you know, I was always really struck by this. You know, it was the same people, the same people. You know, it's people who, you know, I I might have been at university with them, you know, they are, they, they were like me in every other respect, except what we had chosen to do. Yeah, yeah. Um, hence they had much nicer shoes, you know, right. Cause, cause they were being paid 20 times as much, but you know, like, so, but, but fundamentally, and I, and I'm really not saying that to, to sort of put myself on some kind of 
uh, morally righteous activist pedestal because I've spent the last three years like really digging into and questioning mm. the idea of activists putting themselves on a pedestal mm. and yet it does seem unavoidable that you know as a, as a statement of you know observable fact that it is this attitude to what money sure well, yeah. money is a neutral thing that it makes I, a difference I, I I broadly agree I'm just like, like you say it's another conversation but yeah sure. how do you do it we, do we have time I'm, to do that we kind of do I mean I I I don't know quite how, how I'd articulate it. Um, it's actually very rich. I mean, you can begin to see lots of ways of answering it. But the whole idea that everything has some kind of source, you, you know, it's, it's almost a question of free will at some level, because if you start to un, you know, examine one thing, the whole universe is kind of contained in it, right? In the same way, the money before it was bad was presumably good um, or, 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 or neutral or neither. It has an origin, but what you're trying to do is say that don't take money if you think that the money, the value of that money, or not even the value of it, because the value of it can be used to, on good things, but the origin, or the most recent origin to be precise, or the most recent source to be precise, is ethically um, compromised, if not worse. Because to do so, you're complicit in some way with that, with them holding that money legitimately. Um, so you're tacitly propping up what they're doing by taking their money because you're saying that they that the the value that they're giving to you is a legitimate source of value. Whereas not to take it is to say it's not legitimate, something like that. And but as I was thinking that, a lot of people have been joking, and I think it is a joke, although there might be some truth in it that all of these mansions, apparently there's a whole area of Surrey where there's multiple Russian oligarchs mm -hmm. and um, several places in Belgravia, as I mentioned, lots of them are empty and are, they're effectively banks in their own way because they're just ways of putting money in somewhere, hoping it will accrue in value. They're saying, look, uh, just use them to house the refugees, you know? Put, you know, these people need homes, they're fleeing for their lives. Take these ill-gotten gains and turn them into something good and let people live there, right? So I hear that, I think, oh, that's kind of elegant. You know, at one, one level it feels wise and proportionate and symbolically powerful. But another part of me feels it's just very unreal. You know, it's very, it's not real politic. It's not how things work and how things are. Um, so yeah, that brings us to London, I suppose, with a, with a, with a bang. Um, it does. Yeah. Is, can, I just, can I say one more thing about the, about the money though? Because I, I suppose there's this, um, you know what you're talking there is a kind of Robin Hood approach, um, which is you know take the bad gives to the good. Yeah, um, take take the thing that has its origin in bad and do something good with it. Like as you was talking, I, I was just re remembering um, the late Anita Rogers. Way, I'm not endorsing it, just for the record. Like I'm just yeah, no, of course. No, 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 experience. No. I wouldn't want to sound as though I was tacitly endorsing it. Yeah, no, no, but, but it is interesting. I, I remember Anita Roddick, you know, of, of, of the Body Shop. She funded. Um, the first year or so of the work I was doing at Global Witness in 2006 or seven. Um, you know, and her approach to this was, and I'm totally sort of paraphrasing and her family can sort of correct me if, I, if I'm wrong, but it was along the lines of like, you know, sometimes you just got to take the money and do something good with it. Right. Um, and I think that I don't want to get to, you know, and there's, there's, there's difficulties of this with lots of campaigning work, you right. know, like people who are trying to change the world usually need, you know, they're not earning money in the system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah doing the system, you know, you know, this running an organization. So it's like, well, where do you take your money from? You do the due diligence, due, due diligence on the, on the funds. There's, there's, there's always these questions about it. Hmm. And what you don't want to do is take um, money for that, per, you know, in a sort of Robin Hood scenario, take money that allows the philanthropist to then position themselves, to, to launder their reputation effectively, right, right, to then right. position themselves right. um, as, as doing some, you know, and which, you know, the whole sort of corporate greenwash Sure. All, all of that, I think, is problematic. It's not quite in the same category as the oh. facilitation that we're talking about in the pinstriped oh. army. But I think it's different again to, for example, housing uh, refugees who need shelter in mm. in those homes. I, I yeah, I that they're all slightly different versions. They are. They are. No, that, and this is like a, um, we could, we could it's like a great with its own texture and its own. Uh, yeah nuance of course once you get to know it so so coming to the sort of present day because yeah. i my, my intuition here and it's only that is that basically the conservative government particularly 
maybe further back UK more generally, but particularly the Conservative government um, has for quite some time been willing to take lots of Russian money for campaigning reasons, partly, um, often rewarding with titles of various kinds, but if not rewarding, then in, in other ways, making you know favorable policy environments and so forth. And that what's in effect happened since the Ukraine war began was the government may in some level want to be seen to do to be doing more but in order to reveal the full extent of what's what needs to be done they have to show their own complicity in how it happened something like that is that your take as well yeah i i think i think that's there's absolutely quite a lot of that um you know i think i think there have been in that funding of um you know, like the conservative friends of Russia and all, you yeah. know, all of that. I was reading Oliver Buller's extract from his new book that was right. serialized um, earlier this week. Um, you know, and as I was reading it, I was thinking, you know, and they were confessing effectively, the people he'd interviewed to, to naivete and, and right. you know, effect, you know, perhaps having sort of been. And just to be know, clear, what is the nature of that naivety? It's, is it that they may, because, you know, it's not like, you know, this is one of the problems of the moment as well. There's all this attention and compassion going towards Ukraine. But, you know, around the same time that the war broke out in Ukraine, the Taliban were sort of rounding people up and killing them in Afghanistan. It was a particularly bad time there. Um, there's still horrific things happening in Palestine um, and various other parts of the world, even the US, some parts of the UK. You know, I guess I only mentioned that because when it comes to this question of naivety, like on al almost anywhere you look, something is going wrong ethically. There's, there's you know, there's, there's very little sort of purity of source here. Um, on the other hand, people want to feel that they're doing as little harm as possible and as much good as possible. I suppose by naivety in this context, it's something about whether the Putin regime was, you know, maybe not exactly democratic, but not exactly evil either. Um, whereas actually it's beginning to look that there is a certain amount of evil in the system and a willingness to just kill and um, and both its, own, both its own troops and civilians on the other side. Yeah, so there's, there's, there's a lot to unpack here because I, you know, I think, I think there's certainly, it'll be the case that some MPs you know, who've taken money have sort of been, you know, sort of willfully blind, um, naive, you know, they've been sort of useful idiots right. uh, in, a, in a way. And I think there, are, there is also a category and, you know, where do we draw the line? We haven't had a proper inquiry. You know, the Americans had the Mueller inquiry yeah. into the Russian funding of, of the- well, We um, did have this, there was a Russian report that wasn't were, were very well read in the UK. And I believe yeah. it was quite damning, but it wasn't, quite as damning as they expected so it's somehow yeah didn't... and we've not had the like the real overhaul of it and crucially it's not had it's not had the attention um right. you know despite the best efforts of some really brilliant journalists who've tried to i'm thinking of carol cadwell at the observer yeah. you know yeah, yeah. who've really sure. sure. been um are worth following now because they're saying some really interesting things about this but I, I you know i'm thinking about the what we saw in the brexit process was conservative mps willing to really um, play roulette mm. with the national interest mm. um, in order to promote their own rise right. and and or say and save their own skins and and that process is going to that's what you allude to now is that process is what may prevent you know proper action now you know why is it we haven't yet had a full and immediate and swift set of <laughs> sanctions right. you know, is it in the absence of full information about all these relationships which are still coming out mm -hmm. in the in the inevitable um suppositions that are being made about you know who's taken what um and where the interests really are it's hard not to avoid that conclusion yeah. isn't it yeah. no, none of which is good for none of which is good for our democracy uh, or you know our capacity to get mm. onto these things. But I was wondering with the UK, if we, if we can kind of come back to look at, because I think this is older right. and, and, a, and part of, we're seeing here the, um, the sort of slightly grotesque flowering of, of, of things that were planted 
seeds that were planted decades ago, right. actually, because the, right. the root of the UK's, um, now is transformation the word or was it evolution? Maybe it was an evolution, um, but it was deliberate either way into a, a tax haven of its own, mm. um, a sort of offshore centre. And by offshore and tax haven, I don't necessarily mean there's no tax here or that there's the kind of secrecy here, but there is definitely a lax regulatory environment, right. which is one of the key um, characteristics right. of the sort of offshore in the, in the sort of broadest sense of the word. Right. You know, it doesn't just mean islands in the Caribbean or the Channel. Right. Um, this lax regulatory environment was an absolutely deliberate decision right. from the end of empire. Right. That was the transition that was made. Now, imperial logic and imperial economics is that you, you extract from, I'm using colonial logic terms here, uh, without endorsing them, you extract from the periphery in order to funnel money towards the centre. The centre was always the city of London. That's where the companies were incorporating, you know, from, from you know, buccaneering and piracy through to, you know, solidified political empire right. and the sort of political economy of empire. Um, the money is flowing to the centre. Um, and, and we didn't want to give that up. Right, right. Um, and so from the 1960s, from late 50s, 60s, certainly, the creation of the UK as a destination for hot money, lukewarm money, any money, we right. don't really care. We just right. want the money. Right. And, so it and so it keeps flowing. Now the pattern of illicit financial flows from already impoverished countries, countries impoverished by, um, by empire and, and, and then globalization mm -hmm. more recently, um, the pattern is for the money to keep flowing. You right. know, so for every dollar in aid, that goes to an impoverished country, you've got you know eight or ten or whatever the number is according to the stats that year of dollars flowing back out mm -hmm. into the major financial centres that are the same place as the aid is coming from. Right. Um, that that is the pattern, and that is the pattern that the UK set up of its tax havens, which were a combination of a lax regulatory environment in London, including for banks from other countries. So in, there was this it was called euro dollar market, euro, euro markets, right. um, which was American banks which would have been more heavily regulated mm -hmm. in the US, able to operate under a sort of lax regulatory structure offshore in London. Okay. That was the beginning of some of this a few decades ago, right. combined with Nick Shackson in his wonderful book, um, Treasure Islands, which was all about how the British tax havens work. He calls it a spider's web. So London is the center. I and see. then you've got you know, Jersey and Guernsey, Isle of Man, and then the, the offshore, the overseas territories in Green, the Caribbean. Uh, in the other, yeah. Cayman, British Virgin Islands, Anguilla, and, and they've all got slightly different things they do. You know, British Virgin Islands does company incorporation. Right. Um, Cayman is where all the hedge funds are now. Right. Um, you know, and they've changed over the decades, but in different ways, they're all... And how important, I mean, this is, this, so I mean, on the one hand, I think it's kind of uh, sneaky and pernicious and um, people have known about this for a long time, but there's, you know, how much of, how much of Britain's wealth relies on that sort of behavior is there a way of quantifying that there probably is and i should probably have done some research before i came on this call to give that's to right. throw a number at you and I, I haven't got a number to throw at you and but i'm really sorry it's it's we'll it, no no that's we'll all right but, no, no. but if you look i suppose one thing to do would be to look at the amount of uh the uk's economy uh that is dependent on the city of london yeah and what it's doing yeah and then, you know and, and again you know Critics of what we're saying would say, "Oh, but most of that's legitimate." You know, you're you're right. you're talking about. No, but well, I was going to say, a pro I mean, a portion that is in question is not legitimate. But, but, but if we're talking about this criminogenic environment, right. Right. you know, in in the sort of broadest terms, then that's not the same as a lax like so a lax regulatory environment is not quite the same as a criminogenic environment. But you're saying there's somewhere where they begin to meet. Well, I think. I think we've got both. A lax, a lax regulatory environment is ultimate, ultimately creates a criminogenic right. environment. It's, it's, like the, it's like the breeding ground for it or something like that. It's, right. it's not the only thing that creates it. I mean, when I say criminogenic, I was when I said that earlier, I was referring to the fact that there are plenty of um, not necessarily illegal, although sometimes illegal, but not necessarily illegal, like profit shifting um, processes that go through the same pipelines right. as the completely illegal stuff and, you know, the facilitation of authority and behavior stuff mm -hmm. and so it's very hard to sort of squeeze the pipeline shut for one bit yeah. and and not for another and then and then another aspect of the criminogenic environment are some some particularly 
British inventions, actually. We've really contributed quite a lot in this sort of evolution of the offshore structures. So yeah. this idea of separating the place of registration um, the, or, the, the, or the, the person who's registering a company from the ultimate ownership of it, called the beneficial owner, that's effectively a British invention, that's now everywhere. Right. That's the stuff that I was going after when we were campaigning for beneficial right. ownership. Right. transparency you know who's really behind this company is it a lawyer in the isle of man no that's not who's benefiting from this company right, right. You go to the isle of man and it says the owners in the british virgin islands you know right, so right. so that's a british invention and the other main one is trusts right. now again trusts which separate the ownership and the control mm -hmm. of an asset mm -hmm. um have legitimate uses right. um you know there might be people who you know, are, are not capable to manage their own affairs. Their, their family might make some arrangements to have beneficiaries of the trust. You know, there, there's all sorts of perfectly legit reasons. There's also an absolute ton of ways right. <laughs> that trusts get used because um, they're perfect to disguise ownership. Right. Um, for all of these reasons to put it around, all of these are, are generated in the sort of British offshore machine. And, and I think we just haven't, we haven't wanted to get to grips with them because a we haven't done our um i think in multiple ways we've not done our post-colonial reckoning well that's the thing i was going to say it's almost got that feeling of what some said about brexit that this was a kind of i don't know playing out of the post-imperial neurosis somehow absolutely absolutely you know you know that you know so i've just read um satlam sangera's book empire land which is totally brilliant yeah. um and it's looking at some of these effects and i think I th you know, I mean, these these psychic effects are are visible every time you know a a a white man explodes on the news at being uh, asked to acknowledge racism or sure. you know like there, there, there are mul multiple ways that it's playing out. You think it, one of the ways might be the might be the structures of low regulation finance? Absolutely, absolutely, right. because because we we have got ourselves sort of hooked on um, hooked on the idea that the money. That the money has to continue flowing. And also, that we're in some sense the center of the universe still, right? Because, yes, exactly. Uh, yeah. we're, we're, whereas we're, you know, I was just chuckling earlier that you know the Economist is now sort of effectively trolling the Brexiters by sort of consistently referring to Britain as a kind of medium level economy. Right. Um, you know, like we we haven't been able to sort of adjust our yeah, yeah. sort of sense of that. But the interesting thing is, of course, is this benefiting the whole of Britain? No, it is not. No, it's no, benefiting it's... the small elite. It's pushing right. property prices up in London right. that pushes out everywhere. You know, it's part of a, there's a sort of, um, again, Nick Shackson and John Christensen, of the, who set up the Tax Justice Network, are working on this idea of the, you know, the finance curse, you know, right. just as you have a natural resource curse where heavily oil or mining dependent economies, right. you know, bad things happen because it ends up pushing everything else out, pushing out right. prices elsewhere, um, and you lose your resilience and capacity, you know, you're on sort of path dependency yep. of this industry that's messing things up. We've effectively got some version of the same thing with the preponderance of Oh. Of, of finance in the economy um you know it's, it's all part of this kind of inequality but we're, we're, we're slightly onto other things there we should probably well, yeah yeah no so just yeah i want to come back to the the sort of premise i suppose i mean mm. here we are day 13 i think or maybe 14 of the war and um it, it sounds like you know sanctions in general are, are causing quite a lot of harm inside russia in a way that they're designed to but it also sounds like there are many more layers of effort that can be applied. And I suppose I want to understand from you your sense of what that what it would take to get to the next level or even to do do the work fully. Um, for example, one, one sort of counterpoint to that is trying to avoid you know, Russophobia or whatever they call it, you know, trying to avoid saying if someone has a Russian name, it must be dodgy, which also doesn't seem right all sorts of children in schools and students at university from Russia that don't want this war any more than anyone else. Um, and likewise, there must be people working in finance who have connections to Russia, but not necessarily to the Putin regime. Um, so I only mentioned that as a caveat to say, you know, what more can be done and how might it be done? Yeah, so I think, We've had this sense, don't we? And I think everyone's everyone's got some version of it. Perhaps it's why we're having this conversation. Is that you know we we want to we want to do something useful, and we you know we want to jump to sort of quick things where we can 
we can do something straight away and sanctions is such a you know it's an obvious thing to jump on yeah. um i mean no, but, I just to qualify that Anthea, just my, my my feeling there is in some ways it's not that in that i feel as though it's a bit too generic like the call for sanctions and everyone's saying you know do more do more sanctions but i sort of feel it's lacking a bit of discernment my, my sense reading into it or feeling into it is that you know people don't really buy that removing an oligarch's yacht or possibly taking away one of his bank accounts is really going to make a big dent on the putin regime um but if there was something more profound that could be done and i don't know what that is exactly but if there's a way of looking at the finances more deeply so the sanctions can bite that bit harder that would be interesting to know like and, and what is that exactly yeah, I mean, I, th I think we've sort of demolished demolished sanctions already then, haven't we, as a, as a sort of simple way of doing it. You know, it doesn't guarantee that the oligarchs affected are going to turn on Putin. No. Um, you know, there's a whole category of what we could call polonium risk, I suppose, right. for them. Um, it's not enough to stop the West supporting Putin in other ways. And I think that's what we're about to come to in a minute, which right. is the enormous, enormous transfer of money yeah. still going, still going his way. Sure. Um, for fossil fuels, I know. you know, although that's, and, le uh, that's lessening a bit, but maybe not quickly, not quickly enough. Yeah. Um, nor interestingly, if, if if we're looking at London, is it is it enough to stop London pimping itself out to the, uh, you know, the next gush of hot money, and 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 dodgy money from somewhere else? You know, right. we won't have transformed these these structures here. I, mean, I can almost see a taxonomy for everything from like corrupt to hot to dodgy to you know. There must be a kind of, you know, yeah, so I'm chucking words around randomly here. I mean, yes. It's a nice um, spectrum of how bad it is, sort of thing. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, to, to, to me, the, and, and, and this is not easy and not straightforward because of the path dependency, because of decisions that have been made in Europe, for example, Germany's decision to turn away from nuclear power. Um, right. Yeah. You know, there's, there's, there's you know, <laughs> investing all that money in Nord Stream. Uh, quite a few people could see that not being a good idea 10 years ago, yeah. but, right. you know, that's what they did. Um, you know, so to, to get us off off the fossil fuels and to, like that's such a, you know, I'm not the only person saying this, you know, yeah. it, it, it is a no brainer given sure. the other great elephant sure. in the rooms behind yeah. us yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, of, of climate change. So, but it is not going to be, it's not, that's not a quick fix thing. No, um, but I mean, is there, is there anything, you know, I, I don't know, maybe it's not a reasonable question to ask, but it's just that you have the sense that Boris Johnson or other members of his cabinet will speak of doing it all they can, but you have the feeling that's not true, that there's actually more they could do. And I'm just keen to understand what that is exactly. Well, now, okay, so this is interesting. There is definitely more they could do. Right. Um, but I think uh, not only the, how can we put this? Um, not only the potential complicity and awkward entanglements they're in because of the money that's been taken and other meetings that we don't yet know about and will no doubt come out now. Um, people will be trying to stand things up right now. I think there's going to be a lot of skeletons coming out, of, yeah. falling out of cupboards. Um, but also, you know, we could have a much more, a much more serious overhaul um, of this of this money infrastructure to try and sort of do things that are that are a bit more meaningful mm. um, than just sanctions. Now, some of this is happening already. There's been legislation kicking around since 2017, um, um, a new sort of economic crime bill, uh, mm. which, which will try and put in place some of the measures that campaigners, some of my former colleagues have been calling for for years. Right. Um, so to, uh, to get a register of uh, the beneficial ownership of the companies that buy UK property. Right. Um, so that you can actually see who's coming. Um, so at the moment, it's part of the problem that there could be much more Russian money, illicit or otherwise, in London that we just, we just can't tell where it's from. It, 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 yes, exactly. It's, right. it's been, it, you know, there, there are all sorts of estimates, um, but, but they're not all, you know, because of the way that you can hide it. Right. Um, I mean, the other thing, you know, other countries, there's some interesting examples. Now, French law works differently. Um, and my understanding of this case I'm about to tell you about, I don't think it could happen in the same way in the UK because there were a couple of things very specific to it. But it's very interesting because it shows some of what it takes. There's been um, a case rumbling on in France since 2007 
Mm -hmm. uh, which has now just about finished last year, called La Faire des Bien Malaki, the ill-gotten gains case. Nice. Now, what do you know about this? This is no, but is, I, I just like the French. It's a kind of rush, rush yeah, exactly. It's good, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so this is this is a really interesting story. Um, a small French NGO um, in 2007 um, put together a list from open source information of uh, assets that they could see in Paris that appeared to belong to politically exposed persons, senior politicians from other countries where you know it, it, it wasn't obvious that their official means could have brought them some right. risk of corruption. Right. Um, and another NGO called Sherpa um, and then Transparency International France joined in a series of complaints to the French legal system that ultimately ended in them Transparency International getting legal standing to bring a criminal complaint, which an investigating magistrate, which is the system in France, then had to look into. Okay. Um, and this ground through the courts for years and years and years. It took a really long time. There was a lot of pushback first from the French system just to get them the standing to participate. Um, and then once they were actually doing it, because these the assets that they were looking at um, belonged to the family of uh, uh, the late Omar Bongo, the uh, president of Gabon, mm -hmm. um, the Sassungesa family um, of Republic of Congo, um, and the Obiangs of Equatorial Guinea. These are all oil rich states on the Gulf of Guinea where there has been a lot of corruption, in part facilitated by non transparent payments from the oil companies, but money has flown out um, and a lot of it has ended up in Paris. And so they found in the case of the Obiangs and the case specifically of the president's son, one of the president's sons, who's now the vice president. Um, who's, who's known as Teodorin Obiang, just the most kind of almost comic book, extraordinary lavish spending, sort of 110 room mansions, like lists and lists and lists of fast cars. Um, and, and eventually the French state went after them. Right. Um, and he was tried in absentia um, and, and convicted and appealed um, and then lost on appeal. Um, mm last summer, which, which should give rise to a process of restitution where those assets are sort of, but they've already been confiscated. There was a right. sort of sort of dramatic moment when all the cars were taken off on a massive car transport. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, but in terms of, yeah, so, so that kind of, yeah, so I'm interested in that kind of thing in the sense that, you know, if it's, if it's likely, or if it's conceivable at least, that a critical mass of wealth and power resides within the UK in the form principally of property to some extent in bank accounts. Um, you know, is there, you know, presumably with enough investigative work, the government can figure out, figure that out and find that yes. out. Yes. And then make a decision and resolve to actually freeze them or, or take them over or right. whatever. But so there's a lack of, well, I was going to say, but it looks like there's a lack of political resolve, A, to yes. do that, and B, to do it quickly enough. Yeah, so, I mean, it's, it's a hell of a process to go through. So let's look at the UK equivalent. Um, there's a, been a unit which is currently in the National Crime Agency. Um, it used to be sort of part of it was in the Metropolitan Police and part of it was in the City of London Police. And the bit that was in the Metropolitan Police, and this is interesting, it was funded by the then DFID, the Department for International Development, right. with a view to... Um, you know, putting aid into into a leaky bucket. The idea was to try and catch kind of corruptly obtained resources coming around the other way. Right. There were some successful prosecutions. The best known one is um, James Ibori, uh, a Nigerian state governor, and there were some other ones, Darié um, and, and Alamasia. And and they they there was such a specific um, coming together of factors that allowed that to happen. Right. There was. Um, enough evidence available from Nigeria of the predicate offence mm -hmm. because the regime had changed mm -hmm. and so there was a political will to go after some of the people associated with the previous regime. Um, there was very good cooperation with the anti-corruption head there um, right. and with the police unit. Um, there was funding in the UK to make it happen. This funding from DFID meant they could sort of ring fence the activity of this particular unit that was looking at proceeds of corruption in London and they weren't having to compete with an unbelievably long domestic agenda of crimes to prosecute that are going on here which right. even within the realm of corruption includes British companies bribing abroad right. and facilitating corruption that way which is another massive thing yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So, so without that kind of ring fencing, so all those things came together, and for a short period there were some, you know, there were some prosecutions for corrupt money. You know, the, the serious fraud office has had has had a hell of a time the last few years trying to get major corruption prosecutions to stick. Yeah. Um, and you know, there are there are all these there are all these factors that go against it about resources. You know, like who, who you know, if we're putting that against law enforcement resources here and some of the oh, yeah. some of the claims for that. Um, and then there's the political will and interference. I was told absolutely point blank on more than one occasion by law enforcement sources that they had worked up a case, you know, which was prosecutable. Right. Um, but because of diplomatic reasons um, in um, yeah. what, whichever country it was, you yeah. know, the FCO simply said, no, we're not doing that. Yeah. Um, and yeah. so it didn't happen. And, and, and we just don't hear about these things. And so there's a... So what, what bottom, line then, bottom line for today, is that you're not that politics sort of wins right sorry i didn't get that is that well it's it, it, it's that politics wins over right. the sort of oh. ethics of doing this now what's interesting here is the politics has changed and so right. i think i think there is a possibility for a really really significant shift in how um how the uk sort of money system in london relates to russians as you pointed out that may sweep up people in it that it unfairly, mm. and that may well happen, um, and 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 it may not be enough. But I think that shift is there. There was a great quote from uh, Edward Lucas, who uh, has been writing about Russian corruption for years and writes for the Times. And I think he says something like, "You know, the Caviar Express has <laughs> finally hit the buffers." Right. Um, right. You know, this this is you know a shift in in the UK's approach towards Russian money that. That hasn't, you know, the, the biggest since ninety one, probably. And it, and it takes some time because so much inertia, I guess. I mean, it just it just feels frustrating that you you know you have a feeling like Kiev might be in surf, you know, might be invaded any day now for real. Um, I mean, they've been trying for a while, but it, it looks like it might accelerate. Odessa in the south might be overtaken quite soon. Then you could have a situation where Ukraine is temporarily occupied. Although, as everyone knows, there's no obvious end game. Um, and it just feels in that context, even if you can't do it yet, an announcement about what's going to be done, uh, maybe that's not wise because it helps people to relocate their assets and so forth. But I think what, from reading between the lines of what you're saying, it's actually even if, you're, even if you have the political will and the political capital of the moment, even then it's not that easy to, right. to yes. undermine these people enough to have an impact politically in Russia. Which is not to say that you shouldn't use all the measures at your disposal right. at this point to do them. Because if you're not going to do it now, when are you? You know, yeah. there's still, you know, I'm, I'm talking here about like the really, like the bigger context of what would yeah. ultimately need to change in order to stop Britain doing this again, frankly. Yeah. Um, but, but that's not to say that there aren't a whole load of policy measures that could be taken immediately. Right. Such you know, as? Like, yeah, well, well, in, well, in terms of sanctioning properly, basically. Right. And then, you know, some of the others will sort of happen anyway. You know, another Just explain, because I, even I don't, you know, I've followed the news quite a lot and I'm not sure I get that. So what would sanctioning more fully in this context in the UK look like? Well, I've been doing it immediately. They haven't, they haven't done, my understanding, I don't know the full details. Yeah, yeah. My understanding is they haven't done everyone yet and they're leaving gaps. In they're leaving tem temporal gaps to allow yeah. people, yeah, which sounds terrible. Um, so, okay, obviously close that loophole if indeed that's possible. Um, yeah, it's just it's just frustrating. Which brings me, I, mean, I think we're coming quite close to the end now. And I wanted to just check in with you in a different register, because mm. um, you've been speaking as sort of financial system misconduct expert. But I mean, you also mentioned, you know, coming to terms with this development more generally. Um, what's your sense of it? I mean. Well, how do you feel about what's going on? Have you had any particular moments that are worth sharing? I can share one of mine if it helps. There was a, and I know that we're both parents, so it might be a point of connection, but um, just quite early, I think day three or four of the war, um, there was a story within a few hours of each other, different parts of Ukraine. Um, a young girl was hit by a shell and badly injured and taken by paramedics but they couldn't save her and she died. She was six years old. And elsewhere in Ukraine, a six-year-old was hit directly and died. And having a six-year-old myself, I just, that day, I was just um, disconsolate really for a few hours because 
obviously we're not on the ground and so it feels guilty to have any feel you know it's almost like guilt about having any feelings at all because you're not caught up in it but um that was kind of brutal and it and i felt similar things since then often with images um particularly images of you know elderly people being taken in their wheelchairs by army personnel and um parents hugging their children goodbye fathers leaving their wife wife and children goodbye to go back to fight um yeah just wondering how you how that's all playing with you at a more personal level i find it completely unbearable and i want to say what i'm going to say without it being sort of engaging in what about her because what i'm going to say doesn't diminish the impact of anything that's going on for, for, for anyone right now. But we are, because of the way the media works, because this is Europe, because also of the operations of whiteness, uh, which are unavoidable, uh, we are seeing more of this mm. than we have seen of other conflicts, some of which have been um, caused by the UK uh, yeah. and certainly facilitated in very direct military ways. And so, and so I feel, <sighs> I feel that each time I have the inevitable responses that you're describing, I feel that. And then I also feel this sort of awareness coming on. Right. You know, what did we not see? Yeah. What do we ongoingly not yeah. see of those other conflicts? Because the ways that, yeah, the ways that it's presented. You know, I lived in Sierra Leone just after the end of the civil war there, which was a very different kind of conflict. And I was very, you know, I became interested in the way that these, you know, some of those resource wars well, that's one thing they were mm. that were occurring in west africa you know the way that they were presented in yeah. um in the western media you know there's a sort of taxonomy of how we how we understand wars in different places yeah so i feel like i'm really i'm really reflecting on that another thing i'm reflecting on is my family we're from that part of the world my great grandfather right. um left um in well early 20th century um so that, that somewhere in my bones, there feels, I mean, it, it seems pointless to even talk about it because it's so much more direct for everyone else. But, you know, if the question is yeah. what's going on for me, that, it's a that's a weird feeling. It's, it's a strange feeling to have guilt about feeling sad or something like that. It's a weird, like a weird concoction that only a 21st century human can maybe have where, you know, you're, you're completely caught up in it, but you're caught up in it from the safety of a relatively peaceful Western country. And, but psychologically you're there all the time, you know, on a regular basis yeah, and, and that's uh, but that's a mediatized effect as well yeah. um which is which is interesting to think on the other thing i've been remembering is that in one i think and I, i'd have to go back into all my notebooks which are archived away somewhere um at some point in one of these meetings that i described when we opened this conversation about trying to endless meetings with policymakers and influencers on both sides of the atlantic to try and influence their understanding of dirty money flows and I found myself with some other think tank. I was, I, I was in DC. Um, anyway, this, all these sort of big American cold warrior blokes were there um, and they were all just off on one about Russia. Now right. this was probably in, I know like 2010 or something. And I was a bit sort of, yeah, you guys, come on. Uh, right, right. <laughs> what are you on about? Right. Um, you know, we, we, we need to get past this, but I've really thought about that in, in, in the last couple of weeks, because I think, I think so many of us, including people in power, didn't, didn't, didn't quite see, didn't add things up. This is why I'm finding Carol Cadwallad is reporting yeah, yeah. really interesting at the moment, because she's talking about... Um, the war beginning in 2014 through this... Yes, exactly. The, yeah, you know, yeah. the, the first great information war. You know, this is the other big picture thing to think about. Yeah. You know, we've been through a communications revolution as big as the one 500 years ago, which prompted, you right. know, reformations and wars and right, right. Uh, all manner of upheaval for, you know, a good two centuries. And so, and, and we're, we, you know, we're only 20 years into it. Um, right. So, so yeah, part, part of that context as well. Mm. I feel like I'm really, but yeah, I, I'm really thinking about all of these occasions on which we were sort of trying to, you know, make the case for looking at dirty money by using security arguments simply as a way to get to these people right. and then look here is the evidence if we can now join the pieces up retrospectively that that was right that was the point of, or one of the points it's not the point mm -hmm. uh, 
to say it to the appointees to obliterate everyone else who's affected by it, which is nothing right. to do at all. But yeah, that, that's one of the things that is coming out there. Right. But yeah, I fear I fear that um, in in pointing out the um, the difficulty of dealing with uh, the dirty money stuff in a sort of quick fix way, right. uh, you know, there's it can be easy to get despondent about that. Right. Um, but it doesn't mean I, you don't try, right? It doesn't mean. Yeah. Well, a it doesn't mean you don't try. I mean, Jesus, <laughs> I tried for a long time, and yeah. you know, it is true. I turned away from trying that as my full time job every day right. um, because I was drawn to trying some other things. Um, but it still need it still needs doing. Right. But I think what's very very interesting, um, as well as the things that need doing, mm -hmm. to unravel the you know the you know the international money pipelines that mm -hmm. that make the hot money flow. And, and particularly, you know, because I'm British and this is where I am, to do the kind of post-colonial reckoning that Britain mm. needs to do, which which really would, as well as all the psychic stuff and all the what do we educate children in, it would involve this unpacking of, of London's role. Right. Um, okay. Yeah, there's there's, there, there, there's there's all that as well. So yeah. there's a lot going on, and I'm conscious that you know we haven't gotten to activism very much, but I also know that you have a a dialogue with Rupert Reid coming out where you're speaking about activism more directly and, and that will give us a chance to talk about the book again um, which I'll mention in the show notes for those who are interested along with your TED talk um, and um, yeah well thanks a lot it's been it's been a it's yeah, thank been, you right yeah. and it's 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 a, it's a it's an edit you know kind of the whole thing is a mess, but the, it's always good to see the mess clearly, if that makes sense. So yes, and, and I think clearly. can can I say have we got time to just say to say one more thing about you know the things that are worth pushing at? Sure. I think actually almost more of my attention in terms of what needs changing right now is you know this this is an epochal moment to get yeah. at the the fossil fuels thing. Yeah, um, yeah, it 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 really is so clear. Yeah, that you're feeding two birds with one seed here, like sure. that's. You know, so in terms of activism and where, where which links to links to disinvestment and you know again it has a financial yeah. side, yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. No, I agree, I agree, and there is an activist side to that because people activists have been trying to get off fossil fuels for decades. So, yeah, and again, you know, rather like what I was doing with poverty and corruption, it's like you know, is this what it takes? Okay, fine, you know, yeah. we right. will we will use the opportunities that arise. Right. Um, like and you begin to see you begin to see all these things are connected at some level too, right? Yeah, yes. which is, um, that one is another discussion. All indeed, right. we'll have that. We'll have that. Anyway, thanks a lot. I'll just stop recording, and it's been lovely to have you. And I'll speak to you again soon. Bye.